Today, we're traveling from Investor Place's headquarters in Baltimore, Maryland, to New York City, where we will be meeting with Omar Kilaf, CEO and co-founder of Innoviz Technologies, one of the car industry's most interesting LiDAR companies. This is a hot market in its early stages with lots of opinions. So we've got a lot of questions for Omar about what's really going on in autonomous driving, what features the car makers are actually looking for, and how the company plans to meet this market. So let's get started. Hi, and welcome to Behind the Wall at Investor Place. I'm your host, Joanna Macris, and today we're back talking about LiDAR. And joining us today, I'm very pleased to have Omar David Kilaf, uh, CEO and co-founder of Innoviz Technologies. Omar, thank you and welcome. Yeah, excited to be here in New York. Yes. <laughs> So let's, you know, let's get into it. I mean, first, from a market perspective, there's a lot of activity in this space. Um, you know, you do have a market dynamic where growth stocks have been under pressure. You know, Innoviz, like many other companies in this space, um, the stocks have been under pressure. Um, there's a bear case view that I think is to some extent propagated by Tesla and others that LiDAR is not a long-term viable technology. Um, I would love for you to address you know, what, you know, the bear case thinking on this space. Yeah, sure. So basically, um, you know, what Tesla is providing now to the market is uh, a level two. And that's what also they declare themselves. It's not, uh, um, now uh, the basic difference between level two and level three is the ownership of risk of, of the car maker. So basically, as long as you're in level two, the, the car maker doesn't take any risk because uh, the passenger you know, is required to look at the road and hold the wheel and engage if something happens. Now, the reason that they cannot move to level three is related to uh, regulations of the car uh, industry, which defines basically any feature of a car that is related to safety has to meet with uh, safety regulations of it calls ACLB. ACLB in, in very high level, it, it means redundancy. It means that there is no single point of failure that might lead to lack of, re of safety, okay? Now, when you talk about an autonomous driving, obviously it relates to safety, right? And it means that you need to have redundancy of anything that might happen in, in the way the car is driving. Now, for sure, cameras are very susceptible to, you know, for direct sun and low light condition. And for that reason, uh, they cannot meet the ACLD. The only way to meet ACLD uh, is to have another sense. So in that case, it's a person. You know, the, the person is actually completing the, the safety uh, requirement. So as long as the person is looking at the road and uh, holding the wheel, they can uh, still provide the functionality. Unfortunately, uh, people are not. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting. You know, the, the reason of most accidents is human factors, right? And the, most of the accidents are related to the fact that people have overconfidence of the road, they, they mostly on straight roads also, because they think they have very good visibility, they can uh, look at their phones, and they, they, they can be, they feel they are safe. Unfortunately, it takes one second uh, for that to change. And level two is actually uh, providing uh, additional overconfidence that makes people even less uh, focused on the road. So it sounds like the near-term market is advanced safety features, and then it's moving more towards fully autonomous driving. The level of the performance of the sensor, uh, basically you can translate the performance of the sensor to the functionality of the car. Uh, the better the sensor is, the capabilities are higher, right? Because uh, in order for a car to drive autonomously in a very high speed, you need to see further, you need to see higher resolution, you need to see higher frame rate. So by the default, Performance of the sensor, you can define whether it's a safety uh, sensor, meaning that it actually cannot meet autonomous driving and only allows the car to give you guidance whether you should uh, be warned when while driving. Or it actually does meet uh, the requirements of an autonomous driving and then you can get to level three. Most of the sensors that are available today are actually not meeting the requirements and therefore only provide the car makers to achieve safety, as you call it. And like what do you eight. mean by not meeting requirements? I think that's oh, thing. it's actually, you know, when you talk with car makers, uh, what they do, I mean, they, they have uh, functional safety engineers. And what they need to do is, uh, once you define the velocity which you want to support in terms of autonomous driving, uh, and the area in which you want to drive, whether it's highway or urban cities, of course, the requirements are different. 
Okay? So the faster you need to drive, you need to have the ability to react to things that are further away from you. Right? So you, if you're driving at 80 miles an hour, you need to be able to detect a problem, which is at least, I don't know, like say 100 meters away. Why 100? That's the emergency braking time of a vehicle at that space. Of course, you would prefer it to be at 200 meters, right? In order to get not only an emergency braking, because you want also the driver to feel comfortable. You don't want that at every point of opportunity, the, the car breaks. I mean, you want to avoid fast maneuvers, fast brakes, and, and basically, otherwise, the, the customer will lose its confidence in, in the system. So it moves from uh, safety requirements to comfort. So high frame it is required for uh, uh, fast reaction. High resolution is required for detection of small objects, which are considered, uh, I would say, a problem for, for the car, of course. And range, of course, in order to detect it further than up. Field of view is also uh, an element of interest, right? Because you want to support a uh, wide field of view to detect in um, you know, cars that are going into your lane, right? Cutting scenarios. And you want to be able to collect, uh, detect an, an object of problem, which is, you know, even if you're driving on a hill, right? And, and like there is, there are definitions of a radius curve of, a, of, a, of the road, and there is a curve of a slope of, a, and, and there are many things that are also taken into account in terms of reliability, because the chassis of the car can change over time which means that the mounting position can change and the pointing decision. Uh, the car load can change and the, the, the pointing of the sensor, uh, even, even wind. I mean, all of those parameters are eventually calculated into the requirements of the sensor and define the field of view. So I, what I, I just told you were, you know, really a mix of many, um, I would say real life, you know, uh, cases that are eventually translated to you know, range, resolution, field of view. Of course, on top of it, price, you know, it's a, in, in an automotive, uh, you know, market, when you talk about tens of millions of cars, every cent counts, right? And, and this is where I suppose we can start talking about the 905 versus 1550. <laughs> right. So, I mean, as you know, uh, you know, there's a camp that says, um, you know, 905 is unsafe to the human eye, um, that the technology is inferior. I would love for you to address, you know, yeah, that and, and cars are dangerous as well, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, LIDARs were using 905 for many, many years, right? So trying to say that 905 is not safe is kind of lazy. You know, it's a, I, I kind of, uh, you, when you're trying to promote your solution by trying to create fear around some, uh, something else, it's a, it's a very interesting strategy. In reality, there are many LiDARs using 905, it's safe. I mean, there are very clear guidance on eye safety. Uh, it's, uh, there are regulations that defines the, you know, the, the standards, and there are labs that qualify a system for eye safety. And of course, when you talk with car makers that are very technical, uh, trust me, they are very minded about that as well. So it's really, uh, I would say, a very interesting uh, position. Uh, in reality, uh, I would try to explain it differently, okay? So, um, using 15-15 nanometer, um, I would say it's a very easy uh, way to try to drive performance because you, you buy a very expensive laser, you use a very strong uh, laser to boost the scene, and you, you obviously the more light you emit into the scene allows you to see further. But isn't the flip side that it's prohibitively expensive or? Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, the downside, you get a very expensive product, a very big one, because using such a powerful laser also requires a lot of uh, power consumption and heat. Okay, so it's a, it comes to size, it comes to price. There are many problems around it. And that's what, you know, led us to understand that 1550 is a dead end. There is no way in, in, the, in the world that uh, volume uh, would scale through 1550. And price is so sensitive in the market, in the car, in the car market, that it's a, it's a no way uh, going to happen. So we knew that in order to uh, get to volume production, we need to use technology that can scale. And the only way to scale is using standard processes. 905 allows you to use silicon instead of ingas. And, and silicon is the most standard process in semiconductor, as you might know, and, and that's obviously uh, the way to achieve cost. Now, of course, in order to exercise high performance with 905, it requires uh, solving the limitations around uh, capping the light source, right? Because the, the, I would say uh, 
the, the, the challenge is to exercise uh, every photon that you get from a light source of 905 because you cannot blown the scene by a lot uh, of a lot of light and it's about exercising every photon you can get it, it if you think about the lidar it's like a communication system okay you have a transmitter you have a receiver a lidar is using a laser for transmission but in the on the receiver side you can improve your snr your signal to noise ratio uh, by improving your antenna meaning the, the aperture in which you collect light i mean just to give you let's take it to the extreme let's say that i have a huge lens in, in front of my sensor, right? Even if I use a very small portion of light, I will collect a lot of light back. So I can I can actually bring back much a very high range. So 905 is really not uh, a limiting factor. Yeah. So I wanted to touch on OEM relationships because there is I think a lot of noise in the industry about companies talking about their order book and you know and and their relationships. So. Um, I, you know, would love for you to comment a little bit about your relationship with BMW and how do these production and development contracts work and how do they roll out and, and what's the time spent and milestones on all of those? Basically, uh, a sales cycle in automotive is, uh, is pretty standard. Okay? Uh, a car maker usually starts with an RFI, which collects the, I would say, the offering from the different car maker, uh, providers. Um, then it's a uh, down uh, list or down select uh, list for RFQ stage. Usually in that stage you have at most two, uh, sorry, at least two, sorry. At most it will be probably three uh, because uh, from the car maker it uh, takes a lot of effort. In order to do the negotiation, it's a negotiation process because the car maker uh, sets a certain requirements Interesting, sometimes they, they push inside requirements they, they know it's impossible to, to meet. It's kind of a test for them. And they, they want to make sure that you're not bluffing, that you're not just complying. Um, and it's, it's an interesting discussion between the different teams. It's not only about the performance. There are technical discussions about the LiDAR, but also about the computer vision, which obviously is another element there, which is super important, which people tend to forget, by the way. It, uh, you need to pass the, the technical requirements, uh, the size is, is, is key. It's interesting, but in some cases, uh, size could be uh, a blocker. Because every car maker has its own design of the car. Uh, some of them want to put it on uh, behind the windshield, some in the grill, some in the headlamp. And, and there is a specific uh, real estate that you, you need to meet. So having a very small uh, sensor is obviously very beneficial. It allows them to be flexible. And, and they complain about that, that uh, they have multiple, they need to support multiple models. And sometimes different models require different locations. Anyway, uh, sorry about this long process. Uh, you go through the RFQ. Usually it takes uh, between uh, six or 12 months, uh, in which they also down selected usually to two. And there is the, the negotiation, of course, of the of the pricing. Uh, the pricing is usually, I think that's another element which is interesting. You, you need to be able to support multiple customers and not, not to offload it on a certain uh, customer. And they actually benefit from the fact that you work on multiple. So sometimes BMW ask me whether BMW is, you know, asking us not to work with others. It's actually the other way around, of course. Car makers benefit from the fact that you reach volume. They benefit from the maturity level and the, and the, the multiple uh, testing that the, that the product is going through. Um, what else would you say to investors looking at this space, you know, in terms of what are we not getting? You know, what is the market missing? Definitely, I would say it's much more active than they might think because people have a, a desire to see every day uh, a press release of the design wing. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, okay? It's a much more discrete uh, industry, and, and we want to be an automotive player. So we want to play by the rules. Uh, I would say uh, there, there is much activity. There are many decisions in the making. Yeah. Do you think that this can be a market where we see commercial mass or volume production by next year? Is this more... Announcement? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, Omar, thank you so much for joining us. You're really welcome. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for watching Behind the Wall. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And check out our website, investorplace.com, for early access to videos and an even more in depth look.